Joining us now is former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. She's chair of the National Democratic Institute and the Albright Stonebridge Group. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for taking time to join us tonight. Great to be with you, Rachel, and terrific coverage. Thank you for asking me. Oh, well, thank you for the compliment. Um, we have, we've had word tonight, the New York Times has reported tonight that the, the, the administration is negotiating with Egyptian officials for Mr. Mubarak to step down um, immediately, handing over power to his vice president for a transitional government. The U.S. government is saying, take, take, taking some distance uh, from that New York Times report. But it, it made me want to ask you, why would another government in this kind of circumstance do what the United States wants in this kind of a negotiation? Well, I think the truth of the matter here is that it's up to the Egyptian people to decide what is going to happen. And uh, I do think that that's a very important point. The administration has been making that point over and over again, is that the Egyptian people are the ones that are speaking. They need to be able to have their voices heard. And, you know, Rachel, there are a number of different ways to go about this. And uh, certainly the way that you've been reporting that the Egyptian government is acting is definitely not the way to get involved in a transition. President Obama has talked about the necessity of a peaceful transition, and we know that there are different methods of doing this. For instance, roundtables or caretaker governments or interim governments uh, that, in fact, have a set of duties uh, that they need to perform, is lift the emergency measures and prepare for new elections and have an independent uh, electoral commission and monitoring of elections. So we know that there are different ways to do this, and beating people up is not the way to do it. President Obama um, has been, and, and Secretary of State Clinton, have been very clear that they want a transition to begin now um, in Egypt and that they want the government to not use violence to try to hold on to power. Uh, neither of those things is happening. What kind of consequences can the United States insist on, given that Egypt is already not doing what they want? Well, frankly, this is not a story that the United States can control. I mean, this is definitely the Egyptian people, and they are being remarkable. If you think about the way that they protested for a number of days, peacefully really voicing their views, I think your introductory comments about how one thing affects another, clearly they were influenced by what was going on in Tunisia, but each of the countries is a bit different. There are different circumstances, and again, you pointed that out, that we need to understand fully what is happening in each one. And here, the Egyptian people, huge numbers of young people who have felt that they didn't have any dignity, didn't have the capability of speaking, uh, were not having any uh, part of any economic miracle, are the ones that are out there. And one hopes that the violence can uh, go away and that there can be a peaceful way of demonstrating that the Egyptian government will react to positively. If the violence Violence uh, continues to get worse. I'm thinking specifically about uh, the large-scale protests that are expected just a few hours from now, Friday after prayers in Cairo. Uh, if the bloodshed gets worse, what are the international community's options to try to stop another Tiananmen Square, to try to stop large-scale state violence against citizens? I, I think it's actually, I hate to say this, very difficult because mm. the international community can make statements. A number of the leaders have already spoken spoken about this, including obviously President Obama and other <clears throat> leaders, and to make it uh, very clear that this is an unacceptable way to behave. But ultimately, you pointed out that the peaceful approach to this is the only way. And Egypt is a great country with an incredible history. And one would think that the statement that President Mubarak made, that he was a great patriot, that he would get the picture. Uh, that this is not the way to make sure that Egyptian, uh, as Egypt as a country is respected, but it's very hard for the international community uh, to interfere. This is an Egyptian issue, and the Egyptian people uh, are speaking very loudly, which is why, frankly, all your points about the journalists is so well taken. This story has to be out there. Um, the, an awful lot is happening through the social networks, but the journalists play a very important role, and our government has said that it's unacceptable for journalists to be beaten up and you are all very much a part of the story and getting the story out is very important. Madam Secretary, if, if uh, b because Egypt has been such a major recipient of U.S. aid, obviously most of it military aid, but in, but in general, in, in terms of the total amount they get from us, it's a ton. They get, we only give more money, as far as I understand it, to Israel. 
If there is a new Egyptian government, is it feasible that the U.S. could insist on secularism in that new government as a qualification for continued aid and close relations? Well, first of all, I think people need to understand where the aid story begins, and it begins with the Israeli uh, Egyptian peace deal, uh, Camp David, where in fact there was a way saying that Egypt, both Israel and Egypt, would get assistance, uh, and it is very much linked to that. Uh, the United States reviews its assistance policies all the time. That is part of what goes on, and there are ways to condition assistance. Uh, but I think that people need to understand what the genesis of the assistance is. Uh, but obviously, it is one of the tools that is in the national security toolbox in terms of affecting the behavior of a government. Now, the other part that I think is really important to think about is that there are numbers of groups uh, that are demonstrating. Among them are Muslims who want, in fact, to be part of a peaceful government. And I think something that has not been mentioned is the example, for instance, of Indonesia. Uh, Suwarto, who had been a dictator, was ousted in the late 90s, and he was replaced by a moderate Muslim secular government. And so it is, you know, people talk about the Iran uh, model, but there is the Indonesian model. And I think that where we should be looking for um, various groups within uh, Egypt that are part of what is known as the People's Parliament, that they are already talking about how to create a government that would be inclusive with secular Muslims in it, that would obviously allow women to vote, uh, and do some of the things that Secretary Clinton talked about in her speech at Doha. Do you have a, uh, an assessment of where the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood right now would fall on the sort of continuum between Iran and Indonesia, as you've spelled it out? Well, they are actually also not a monolithic group. As you mentioned, you know, the Muslim world is not monolithic. And there are those who are willing to give up uh, terrorist um, or the use of force. And if they are to be members of any government, they would have to, in fact, abide by the rules of using uh, peaceful means to operate. And I think one of the issues here had been is that the Mubarak government, by dividing uh, the, the political situation instead of kind of saying the Muslim Brotherhood is illegal, the only choice is the Muslim Brotherhood and violence or us, has made it very difficult for these middle-level groups to operate. You mentioned that I was chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. We have been working within Egypt for a long time in terms of developing various aspects of civil society uh, and talking to various and dealing with opposition groups who are prepared to participate in a fair and free election. The thing that started this off was that the last parliamentary elections were completely fraudulent. And so there, whatever uh, mechanism is used has to insist on free and fair elections monitored internationally and having an independent electoral commission. And if Muslim groups, including part of the um, Muslim Brotherhood, will give up any violent means, then I believe, I said this in a study that I did with Congressman Vin Weber for the Council on Foreign Relations in 2005, that if you give up violent means and are prepared to be part of a secular government, uh, then one has to have an inclusive system that allows various groups to exist. Former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright uh, helping us make uh, some news tonight in terms of potential diplomatic means forward. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel.